Hello again, and as we continue on in our James Bible study, we hit chapter 3 of James, of the five chapters, so we're going to hit about halfway through when we get done with this part today. And we've been doing the saint and the various different things, and today we're going to talk about the saint and his speech. So we're really, if we gave it another title, it would be the untamable tongue. <laughs> as the Lord deals with that, as James writes to the saints, the believers that are scattered all over Asia Minor at the time, and he writes to us today, the Holy Spirit uses this, it, it's all about the words that we say. Now, when we talk about words, the saying that comes to mind to me is that saying, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt me. How many times have you heard that? And, and the reality of that is it's meant to be that in reality, Words should not hurt us. We need to be like a duck sometimes and let them go right off our back like water would off of a duck. But in reality, the fact of the matter is, is that words do hurt. And we will see that clearly. And one of the things that James is hitting as he talks to the people and he talks to us is that he wants us to use our tongue in a way that God would want us to use our tongue. And he's going to be very practical He's going to be very straightforward and he's going to talk about the, the evil that our tongue is. And there's a reason that, it's, that it spews evil. And we will see that very clearly. I would encourage you, there's a book that um, I have found to be very important throughout time and that's the book The Wounded Spirit by Frank Peretti. It has a, a new name that has been republished as No More Bullies and, uh, and No More Victims. Um, so you may see it out there that way, but no more, or The Wounded Spirit is a book that in, does a very good job. Frank Preddy has written a lot of, of fiction material, but this is a nonfiction work. It tells the story of his life and does a great job of how all of us are wounded spirits. And we wound other people with our words and we've been wounded. And it does a great job of pointing to the fact that in the word of God, um, we can deal with those wounds and we can deal with the fact that we are wounders as well. Isn't it a great thing that we have our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who brings about forgiveness? There are hard things that have been said to us over time. There are hard things that we have said to others. And uh, we've had to swallow our pride to ask forgiveness and we've had to forgive. And that book does a wonderful job of leading you into that. Now, let's dive into the scripture right away today. And we want to start out there in James chapter 3 with verses 1 and 2. I've entitled this first part, this letter A in our outline, so to speak, speech and index to a person's character. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man. He is able to keep the whole body in check. Now in verse 1 there you see, and, and if I gave it to you in the order that the Greek gives it, it would be like this. Not many teachers you become, brothers of me, knowing that greater judgment we shall receive. I want to note three things. You see it up on the screen. Note number one, the not modifies the number of teachers. Not many of you should become teachers. Now, when I was a, an administrator at Heritage Christian Academy, um, this is the way I talked to my teachers initially, that not many of us should become teachers. Now, there will see a reason for that. But there's a, quite a responsibility when you are to be a teacher. The second note I want to note there is that you become is an imperative. He's saying, don't become, not many of you should become teachers. He's not saying that people shouldn't become teachers, but he's saying not many of you should be. And then the third thing gives the why. Why? Because you will experience a greater judgment. Now, why a greater judgment? <laughs> because as a teacher, we have a responsibility to the truth. As a teacher, we have influence. We are teaching people, no matter what age they are, 
we are teaching them and we are making an impact upon their lives in a good way or in a bad way. <laughs> now, before I forget, all of us are teachers in a way because we deal with people that are under us, especially if we're parents and things that way. People pay attention to things. But there is a greater judgment to those who teach. That word for judgment there is the Greek word krima. It doesn't necessarily mean condemnation, but we do know that God will look more closely at all teachers when he judges them. Teachers undertake, especially those who teach God's word, we teach it in a way in which God wants it conveyed. And that's of vital importance to be considered when you decide to become a teacher. Now, there's a couple things I want you to remember as well, though, when you become a teacher. I don't want to discourage people from becoming teachers. In fact, I love teachers. <laughs> teachers are special people, I believe. But I want teachers to remember a couple things, too. God gives strength, and there can be so much reward when you teach. I believe God has wired some people to be teachers. He has given them that gift. Because <laughs> as a teacher myself, there is such a joy when you see somebody get a concept. When I was a math and science teacher, there was joy in seeing somebody get a concept and to learn. There's a joy in being able to share knowledge. And as a teacher of God's word, there's a joy that comes when God's word does a work in a life. The second thing I want you to remember is that with much opportunity, teachers, there comes much responsibility. A teacher is not someone who can take it easy, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> teachers who just kind of sit around after a few years or they get discouraged, they need something to recharge that battery. But we need to remember there's a lot of opportunity as a teacher, but there's also a lot of responsibility. And what a responsibility it is that God lays on the hearts of teachers. In 2 Timothy 2.15, we see these words. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Another way to say correctly handles is rightly divides the word of truth. <laughs> When we teach the word of God, we don't need to be sh ashamed. <laughs> but we should take that time to correctly handle God's word and to correctly teach it. Now, preaching and teaching are two different things, but at the same time, they tie together very much. Some people might be better at preaching than they are at teaching, but that's a combination of things, and it should be. We need to rightly share that word. And one day, we must all give account for what we have done. But the teacher will be scrutinized more closely because of the power of our words and what we teach. I believe that's what James, I believe that's what the Holy Spirit through James wants us to see here. And he's pointing out to the believers there. The fourth note that I want you to give, to give you in that passage there of, of verse 1 is that James says we. He includes himself. When he is teaching this, he's not just spouting it out to them, but it serves as an encouragement, as a warning, as a challenge to him as well. He understands it as a teacher. He knows what it is to be in that position. And I believe that a true teacher knows these truths and they need to humble themselves before God and ask for God's strength in that way. There are a number of verses that are out there, but I want you to take a look there at verse 2 of the text. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. James is bringing out that fact that if you're able to do this, you're perfect. If you're able to keep your tongue in check completely and all the time, 
you're perfect. Now, there's a lot of scriptures that talk about the tongue and what comes out of our mouths. I think of Proverbs 16, verses 23 and 24. A wise man's heart guides his mouth and his lips promote instruction. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. If we are a wise man, and we will talk about wisdom a lot in our next session when we hit the saint and sagacity, the saint and wisdom in James chapter 3. And you can go through the book of Proverbs. There are verse after verse about how we use our words. Um, But pleasant words are a honeycomb. They're sweet to the soul. A wise man heart guides his mouth. Now, if we look at the heart of man... (laughs) Scripture also tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? We are born with a sinful heart. In our heart, we don't have to be taught to do wrong. We don't have to be taught to even say wrong. It shows itself up. <laughs> Shakespeare had a phrase that he used. He said, He hath a heart as sound as a bell, and his tongue is the clapper. For what his heart thinks, his tongue speaks. What comes out of our mouths oftentimes is what's in our hearts. Well, look at verse 2 again. And note those words. We all stumble. You see that underlined in red. There on the screen. We all stumble. We all make mistakes. In 1 John 1, verse 8, it says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We deceive ourselves if we say that we're perfect. You know, remember the old song from Mac Davis, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. We all stumble. We need to face that fact. We will sometime have to eat our words. And we'll have to ask for forgiveness at times. We will all offend somebody somewhere along the way. We will all be offended along the way as well by somebody's words or by somebody's actions. If the person can never be at fault in things. James says he is a perfect man. <laughs> you see that there in the um, square there. He's a perfect man, it says in verse 2. <laughs> He's able to keep his whole body in check. <laughs> the word there, to keep his whole body in check, is that word for a bridle. That person is able to bridle everything. And James is noting the fact that none of us are able to do that. I'm not a big horseman. I did ride horses as a a young boy. And sometimes we would bridle the horses. Most of the time I rode bareback with just just grabbing hold of the mane and and riding our horse. But uh, sometimes we'd put that bridle in. (laughs) That bridle would allow us to turn the horse whichever way we wanted to go. If a person thinks they're perfect, they've got to be able to bridle their whole body. Now, I'm going to tell you something here. There is only one that I know of who walked this earth who was perfect and had perfect self-control and never sinned. And that was Jesus. Jesus, the Word, the one who spoke this world into existence, he was perfect. James is bringing this out and he's saying, none of us are perfect. We all stumble. Now, in verses 3 through 8, we see the power of speech illustrated. (laughs) I always love this picture that you see there of Einstein with the tongue. (laughs) I used to keep one up in my office, actually used to. Um, But the tongue is a powerful instrument. And so what James does here is he gives us some illustrations to prove that point, how powerful our tongue is and how powerful our words are and what they can do. 
And by the way, if you ever flip to Proverbs, like I said before, you can note, you'll find proverb after proverb of God-given wisdom of how important it is to control our tongue and to use our tongues in a godly and a wise way. Well, let's look at some of these illustrations there in verses 3 through 8. Let me read these verses first, and then we're going to take them one by one. But it says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Verse 3. Our speech, or what is the tongue like? (laughs) It's like a bit in the bridle. With that bit that goes under the tongue, that's what you can control the horse. It's a small bit compared to the big horse. Yet it has that control. How big is your tongue compared to the rest of your body? Not very big. The second example there in verse 4 is the rudder of a ship. Take ships as an example, he says. Although they're so large and they're driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Now you see that big ship that you see there. The rudder is only that small part that's down in the bottom (laughs) compared to the whole ship. But that's the thing that steers the ship. And he's comparing the tongue and our words and our speech to that. It's a small thing. And that's what he uses there in verse 5. He says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body. The word there for small part is the word micros, where we get our word micro from, (laughs) and small things that way. But that small tongue thinks it's so big. And he says there in verses 5 and 6, That small tongue makes great boasts, but consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Remember the old campfire song? It only takes a spark to get a fire going. It it only takes a small spark, and that can set a whole forest on fire. (laughs) It's that picture of what gossip can do. You and I know what a little bit of gossip can do. My granddaughter recently is all excited, Grace. She is all excited. She's um, three years old now. But she is all excited about the fact, or about watching Larry Boy and the Rumor Weed. If you ever want to watch um, some fun cartoon things that bring out the clear points of Scripture, Larry Boy and the Rumor Weed is one to do that, how a, a small story can be spread and become different things. You've, you've probably played before the, the um, games where you play telephone or grapevine where one person starts it and they keep whispering it in ears until you get to the other side and the whole thing has changed by that time. The tongue is like a forest fire. It's like a spark. It can set the whole world on fire. But you know, it even gets worse and you look there in verse 6. It's, the tongue also is a fire. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And it itself is set on fire by hell. <laughs> yes, what we say can affect somebody's eternity. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. He dealt with the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not commit murder. He says there, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. 
But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, Raka is a word for empty head, idiot, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in the danger of the fire of hell. Are our words important? Most definitely. Do they have power? Yes. Look at verses 7 and 8. All kinds of animals, birds, uh, uh, reptiles, sea creatures, they're being tamed and they've been tamed by mankind. We've tamed some of the largest animals there ever was. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison. Oh, Pastor Todd, it can't be that bad. Well, let's just be honest. I don't have to say a whole lot more. Because you and I know the power of what we say and what it can do or if we take somebody's words wrongly, or if we use them in that way. So yeah, they can be done in different ways, in that way. Uh, the word for tongue, well, there's another way to put it. I liked how it was put in seven and eight, the untamable tongue. Animals can be tamed. No man can tame the tongue. <laughs> if we just put it down very simply, it's very straightforward and very true. The, the word for tongue in the, in the Greek, is glossa. Glossa, like the word we get glossary from and words in that way. But if we just sum up this whole section, we'll see that it says the tongue is like, and then we'll see that it says the tongue is. In my English, if I remember right, similes and metaphors are involved here. Like, and when we say it, it, it is, we get those pictures here. But remember what it's like. It's like the horse's bit. It's like the rudder on a ship. It's like that small spark. It's a small thing, but it controls a very big amount of things. And on the other hand, it says in verses five, verse five, it says that it's a small part of the body. It makes great boasts. And then in verse six, it says it's a fire. It's a world of evil. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of our lives, of our existence on fire. Think of how slander can do that. Gossip or propaganda or spin that's put on things. And then it says it's set on fire by hell. It is, it says there in verse 8, it is untamable by man. It is a restless evil. It spews poison bearing death. It operates everywhere in the world with frightful damage. Jesus put the words this way in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Jesus said, for out of the overflow of the heart, man speaks. I love how another place puts it, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Jesus stated it very straightforward, and, and James is just reiterating it to us. In those times where we get, and we get frustrated and we, but it's what comes out of our heart. That old nature still shows forth. And at times where there's a lot more stress and, and things that way, that heart lets it fly sometimes. Someone listening to James to this point might say, well, I do pretty well with my speech. I'm not too offensive. I don't swear a whole lot. But James here is putting it in the laps of the churchgoers. This is about the saints, those who believe. This is about the professing Christians as well. And that's what I want to give you for that third point, our final point today with this. Hypocrisy of speech of some professing Christians. James isn't just throwing this out at people who don't believe. He's honestly pointing at us who do believe. This is part of the work of the Holy Spirit of sanctification that God begins to work in us. As true believers, we possess the grace of God, which is the divine power that's able to control the tongue 
Yet as James confessed back there in verse 1, we all stumble. And so what he does here is he drives home that point to bring out the reality, to bring out the fact that we need God. We need his strength. We need his wisdom. He says it there in verses seven, or sorry, in verse, verse nine and 10. As you see on the screen, he says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness or in his image. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. And my brothers and sisters, this should not be. He brings home the point. We praise God with our mouths. We sing. We spew the, say the words out. And I pray that when they're said, we aren't lying or deceiving, but we are letting it come from the heart, or we're just not saying it for the sake of saying it. But out of the same mouth comes that cursing of men who are made in God's image. And then he just simply states that phrase, this should not be. It is necessary. It ought to be so that we don't do this. It's the only time that phrase of it is necessary is used in the whole New Testament. This should not be. (laughs) It denotes the incongruity of blessing and cursing coming out of the same mouth. If I put it in my own words, it's this whole idea. It doesn't make sense. (laughs) And then the point is brought home with clear examples in verse 11 and verse 12. (laughs) Can both fresh water and salt water come from the same spring, my brothers? My brothers, can fig tree, a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. <laughs> it's impossible for a salt spring to give you fresh water. The sweet and bitter contrast is here as well, but salt water will contaminate fresh water. You won't get fresh water out of that spring unless it's fully cleansed again. And it's the same with a fig tree. Does a fig tree a fig tree give olives or a grapevine bear figs? That's impossible. Even if we try and adjust the genetics, but it's impossible. This is clearly revel, 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 relevant and he brings it out to us. <laughs> As we go through this, I just want to note to you again the power of the tongue. (laughs) The power of our words. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. (laughs) I don't have to say a whole lot more to you. And I just want to close off this Bible study by reading these verses again, verses 1 through 12. But I want to read it to you from the paraphrase of Eugene Peterson's called The Message. And again, it's a paraphrase and it's put into street language. But listen once again to these words. And when the last word comes out of my mouth here from verse 12 of this, this Bible study will be done. But again, Remember the power that are in our words. I don't want to discourage people from becoming teachers or to be teachers, but remember that what we say has a lot of weight to those that are listening. Listen closely. James 3, 1 through 12 from the message. Don't be in a rush to become a teacher, my friends. Teaching is highly responsible work. Teachers are held to the strictest standards and none of us is perfectly qualified. We get it wrong nearly every time we open our mouths. If you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person in perfect control of his life. A bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that, 
By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. This is scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. With our tongues, we bless God our Father. With the same tongues, we curse the very men and women whom he made in his image. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. My friends, this can't go on. A spring doesn't gush fresh water one day and brackish the next, does it? Apple trees don't bear strawberries, do they? Raspberry bushes don't bear apples, do they? You're not going to dip into a polluted mud hole and get, get a cup of clear, cool water, are you? My friends, may your tongue be in the control of Jesus. May you go forward in his strength. Amen and amen.